Stay tuned. Today, I sit down with Mike Konopek, who shares his highly strategic marketing strategy to find the ideal buyer. As always, I'm your referral partner out of San Francisco, Sean Kunkler. Mike, thanks for joining me today. Hey, Sean. Thanks a lot for having me. I'm excited. And, you know, before we get started, I want to say that you are now officially invited into the Inner Circle Group, which is all the past guests. We get together and we network um, outside of this podcast. So, great. Welcome. Thanks a lot. Yeah. I know you're a networker. So, that'll be amazing for you. Very much so. Uh, let's dive in to give some listeners some context really quick up front. In a couple sentences, who are you and what do you do? Well, I'm Mike Konopek. I'm with Compass Whidbey Island in uh, Whidbey Island, Washington. So I sell island and waterfront properties, residential primarily, in the gorgeous islands of Puget Sound. And um, so it's pretty much second home markets, uh, luxury, luxury beach homes, things like that, island homes. And um, it's, it's uh, very interesting. The properties, the individual properties are very interesting. It keeps me uh, motivated and mentally stimulated to do my work. And, yes. and uh, the, what's really nice is because so many of them are dream homes, whether they're a second home or a retirement home, people get really happy if they find the right one. That's, <laughs> so that's, that's nice. That's the magic. That's the hard part right there. Yeah. And, and so if there are secondary homes, where are they coming in from? What market are they typically? Uh, the most in? feeder markets is about, I get about 40% from uh, Metro Seattle because it's a, a ferry and a, it's a ferry ride or a bridge. Uh, so it's nearby. And then um, about 40% from California, both northern and southern. Mm -hmm. And the, because in California, this area is known and then it's just random. I'm closing on one with Mass. The two I have in escrow now are one is a buyer from Massachusetts, one from Texas. So it's, uh, uh, it's pretty much, it's pretty much national, but the, the consistent feeder markets are Metro Seattle and California. That's amazing. You must have a phenomenal referral network within those markets. Yeah. I tell you, but the networking that you mentioned, I get uh, my business is not the traditional real estate broker. My father actually did real estate on this island for like 35 years, and he was the whole, the small town trusted broker whose families did all families. People referred neighbors to him and everything. I get virtually none of that. I'm more of a marketer and I do niche marketing and uh, get out there and I market to agents. And so about 60% or more of my uh, business right now is inbound agent referrals, That's primarily amazing. for buyers, but some listings as well. That's amazing. So yeah, it's a huge amount. I, I think that's really fascinating that, well, your dad had a very different book of business than you did or do. Mm -hmm. And within that, you were able to evaluate and figure out a, a different way to crack the same nut, which is cool. Yeah, exactly. I, I, the properties I sell are different than he sold family homes in neighborhoods and um, and he loved doing it because he liked being the trusted advisor. So. Um, I am more of a, a niche marketing specialist and I want to sell just something, find you exactly what you want. So what I did, I have a background in uh, a business and finance, international business and finance, and I tend to, and strategic planning also. So I analyze things. And so I just, just my eighth year in real estate. So when I joined, I said, well, I don't want to do what everybody else is doing. That'd be foolish. So I want to analyze it. The oddity of doing it here is that the group of customers that I think were underserved were the high-end customers. Mm. And that's because um, realtors have a focus, the average real estate agent has a focus of, on their own little town or their own neighborhood. Or they don't like to drive three hours to show a house or whatever. But the buyers and even the sellers around here with second homes and investors and that type of thing, um, a lot of people routinely will say, I want to look at all the islands in Puget Sound. Well, you, it's hard to get around from one to the other. And mm -hmm. there's hundreds of islands. So 
I'm looking at all the islands. I don't know where I want a house, but I want a house kind of like that, that lifestyle. So um, I decided to cover a wider area to serve those people. And it's, it's, and it's uh, paid off a lot. And in addition, this year, I joined with two other uh, friends of mine who are also luxury waterfront island brokers. And we've, so we decided to cover all Puget Sound together seamlessly just to help the clients be client driven. So somebody could come to one of us and say, I want to look at the whole area and we just hand them off back and forth. And um, that means the client doesn't have to Google the local real estate broker and hope they get somebody competent. Then they can just specialize with us. Um, so we formed that. We called it the Northwest Island Alliance. And I think it's actually a, 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 a model that would work in like for ski towns or for the type of second homes in areas Say somebody once in Northern California, I'd love to live in a wine country. Well, there's a number of wine countries, right? There's a number of counties, et cetera. So form a network where you can just have this buyer look everywhere and just be, and know that they're still with the same team. Even though we're not a formal team, we work as partners. So it's, it's an interesting concept and I think it works pretty well. It's really getting traction. That's amazing. It's similar to I'm out of San Francisco and people tend to have kids and then they'll move to Marin, which is north, or right. they'll move to the East Bay, east, mm -hmm. or they'll go to the South Bay to be closer, a shorter commute time. And then generally speaking, once the kids go off to college, they want to go back to the city. They want to be close right. to everything. So they come back in. And I'm actually, it's funny, but I'm in the same process right now of strategically bringing on bringing on agents in those strategic markets so it's a seamless experience yes. regardless of where they're looking yeah it's really if you just it's funny how in this business if you just put yourself in the clients just empathize with the client just put yourself in that particular client's position and try to make their life easier with with local knowledge and expertise but also just generally easier why should somebody who wants a, a place in Marin after he knows you, why should he have to go Google Marin County Realtors? Right. You know, it doesn't make any sense. Um, so, and you keep it in house and, and it works better for everybody. It does. And to your point, you can then control their experience. And so regardless of which of the three they're working with, they're having the same amazing experience, regardless of where they find that dream home, which I, I always feel that's the important part is it's, it's the client's experience through it. Absolutely. So by doing on the client's experience, plus clients are not particularly consistent in explaining what their, what their real True. Uh, goals are. They would change from one to another because they don't think in those terms. So if, if I work with somebody for a little while and then I hand them off to one of my partners in the islands, um, then I can just tell them from a real estate point of view, this is what they want. And then they don't have to re-explain themselves. There's no learning curve there. They can just uh, be represented. And clients are, are liking it. And the other funny thing is, once I do that, and when I'm in a listing appointment and I explain it to a seller, this is what we've done. We formed this group. They go, well, that's pretty clever. And, you know, they actually appreciate it that you're proactive in your thinking and creatively. I've had that response I, from a number of uh, sellers. I agree. And, you know, to go back from the buyer's perspective is they're going to love, fall in love with the property. And we don't know exactly what that is, where it is, price point, bedroom count. I've had so many clients who were adamant yeah. on wanting one thing and they buy something completely different. Happens all the time here, all, all the, the time. time. Yeah. Especially at the, at the luxury price point, it's sometimes the numbers are a little bit more fluid and they just find that home and they're like, oh my gosh, this is the one. Right. You get somebody that says my max budget's a million and you look at all that and you're following their direction and they go, I found this one for a million five and you're going, well, okay, but I didn't show you that because... <laughs> It's a, you said you a million. So, um, but that's okay. Um, and people have, uh, uh, people have different ways of organ organizing and rearranging their, uh, assets. So, 
It's so uh, it just depends. <laughs> I literally just wrote an offer for a client for 2.2. Their max budget was two, but they were looking at properties at one seven. And they just, they emailed me on the side. They're like, hey, we found this on Redfin. We want to go see it. And I'm like thinking to myself, that's not even close to what we talked about. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's kind of my life. I get that all the time. All Which I think is, I think it's across the board. I mean, I think it, it's a, it's like a working concept from the buyer's perspective. And I know for me, even if I'm not looking at houses, but let's say I'm looking at a car, it's a working concept until I figure out, sure. do I want a sports car? Do I want a four wheel drive? Like, what am I going after? Right. And then you start looking and then you obviously, whatever you want is always a little bit extra. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And people, no matter what they say or how disciplined they try to be, they tend to tend to go to the nicer one at the end. Yeah. And it's funny. My other rule within that is I don't care if it's a $20 watch or a $20,000 watch, whatever the price is, it's always too expensive. They want a better deal. <laughs> yeah. Well, all of the, if you think of, cause I, I get virtually nobody local other than some listings and they don't know the market, right? So somebody's from Southern California and they, they're looking at houses, they know what they like, but they're looking at houses and all, then they'll finally just turn to me and say, is, what do you think, is this a good price? And then they'll always want to get 50,000 less. No always. matter what. Yeah. Yeah, always. if you're like, oh my God, it's a smoking deal. It's actually underpriced, this and yep. that. And they're like, all right, can we go lower? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's just human nature. I, that's like, human for nature. me, that... It's that psychology that's that's what always keeps me very engaged with the business because you just never know what curveball you're going to get. And that's the part that it just keeps me highly engaged and, and always like very intrigued with what's going to happen next. Yeah, it does. And the, um, once in a while I have said, so if you like this house, pay them what they asked. Why would they say no? I've said that a few times, but... Usually I'll try to get them the 50,000 less, you know, I'm representing them. So yeah. maybe you can. So chat with me about you're doing obviously very strategic marketing to these groups. How are you approaching it? And I'll just preface this with, we all get blasted from other emails in other markets or agents in other markets who just generically will send you listings or they send you their newsletter. And it's, it's so not related or value add that we mm -hmm. wind up just unsubscribing. So right. I guess my, my convoluted question is how do you do it, deliver something of value and, and not get the unsubscribe on the back end? Um, well, from uh, the marketing that I spend for clients, uh, for lead generation, I target exclusively to buyers um, and buyers. Uh, I use, I tr over the years, I've narrowed it down to work with basically an ad agency level. It's not an ad agency, but it's quality of ad agency to market on two platforms, which I usually alternate Facebook ads and Google AdWords ads. Mm. And then lead generation, it's lead generation. The big difference that it comes with my type of second home market is it's a want to, I want to buy that. It's not a have to. I just got transferred. I start my job and my kids start school. I gotta have a house. So, so it, you gotta have a time horizon where it could take you four years. Frequently they won't, they'll change their mind. I've, I've had a ton of people just say, you know, we're ready to buy that beach house. And hey, guess what? I just bought a house in the mountains, you know? So it's like, um, well, you know, that's just gonna happen. Um, and it can take, and I will have, because I uh, send out weekly emails to these people that I lead generate, and they're consistent and they're just kind of reflect who I am, but they're not the newsletter emails that I get from 100 agents. They're not the, the standard newsletter. They're more uh, reflecting my personality. They're more data-driven. And mm -hmm. then show some real estate, show a couple things about luxury real estate. And then... Um, but frequently, this has happened a number of times where I will have somebody read my emails for four years, never contact me, but they'll read them. And then, hey, could you help us buy this house? And then you go, sure. <laughs> and, and it's like, 
Yeah, and it's like, okay, so thanks for reading my emails, but they don't have a reason to contact you. They just get your emails. They don't have to contact you. Thanks for the emails. So, um, so you have to know what your time frame is on that. And I have, uh, I have people that I know, other brokers I know that work the uh, relocation market or work a military market or do something like that. And those people have to have a house by a certain day. And so let's go get it done. So that gives them a certainty that when they have the client, they'll get paid. My people, who knows? And the, another big thing to my buyers is um, my knowledge of a very specialty market and off market, which I think is going to increase with the changes in our industry. I think it's going to increase fairly dramatically. And so finding an agent, I think buyers will become, buyers and sellers both will become more discerning that they find an agent that actually works the market and knows on market and off market rather than just use somebody they liked from a different area, which you saw a lot of, which you still see a lot of. I think they're going to realize they need somebody who really knows what, what and can find them what they want because it's going to get a little more less organized. It, it, if somebody's listening on the podcast, I'm literally nodding the whole time. I, I fully 100% agree. I, prior to this whole NAR thing, sellers were the more discerning of the two groups and yeah. they would typically vet a couple agents before choosing one. I feel that shift's now going to happen with the buy side and very representing buyers and they're, you're going to have to convey your expertise. And that's, it's, it's funny, but when I came across your name, I found a video that you did and that's why I reached out to you and was like, Hey, I'd love to have you on the podcast. You're the, the way you presented the video, I actually watched it, which as an agent, we all see a ton of videos and I click off of them immediately. But the way that it was positioned, your personality definitely was able to shine through, but you were pointing out things that indicate that you're an expert in this specific market exactly. and it was just so well done. Thanks. Thanks. That was a, I was very pleased with that video. Um, just like you're just like what you're doing here. It was very highly produced and properly done. And you do have to, uh, this type of a market, if you make a mistake in, and you buy a waterfront home on an Island and you, for a couple million bucks and you make a mistake on that because you have an urban agent who doesn't know, not only doesn't know the market, forget the market. What you don't know are the actual real estate details, such as is your home going to slide into the ocean or is your septic tank going to work? And that's so what on and on and on and on. You have to, it's the basic stuff that you have, that you should know, but if you've never done it before, you don't know it. So, um, so the local expertise just in real estate is, is the minimum. And, but people still bring their own, you know, best friend from home to be their agent. And that does not... it part time sometimes in some yeah. markets, but not good. <laughs> no, uh -uh. I, I, I mean, literally I mean, if I had, I, you're in San Francisco. If, if, if I was a, an agent in Marin and I had somebody that wanted to buy a $2 million condo in San Francisco, I wouldn't do that. I mean, you just, there's nothing yeah. wrong with collaboration and referrals. So, I mean, Amen. that's how the should be done to serve the client. I like three weeks ago, looked at a property in another state and I don't know what to look for. I don't, San Francisco, we don't do well tests. We don't do right. septic. I, so I don't even know what to ask. So I'm hiring an agent to help me find a property because yeah. I, I know real estate and I know how to buy properties or help people buy properties, but I don't know that specific market. So I don't even know myself what red flags and what to ask. Yeah. And so what you do know, though, what you do know is that agent, when you hire a good one, that agent will earn their money. Because, yeah, they'll save me money. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. And even we were joking about the, the nuances of wanting to get a better price like they will they will know the etiquettes in that market to help pull True. those levers to get you to that point. Whereas True. You I tell you, that's a funny point you have because the nuances, the psychological nuances vary. Yeah. So we'll get somebody, 
you know, maybe somebody's buying a beach house here that's going to be their third or fourth home, and they're uh, from, you know, a financial guy from L.A. or whatever, and money talks, and they come in, and they throw money. Sellers don't always like that in these little towns around here, and I've seen it a number of times, and I've won by saying, here's how we're going to treat you. And that guy is going to tear down the kitchen you just designed. So, you know, and I've won a couple of uh, uh, contracts that way. Not everybody, if you're selling, not everybody who is selling needs that extra $20,000. They're not always going to take the highest price. So you have to treat the seller with, uh, give the seller what they want and treat them the way they want if you want to win the, win the deal. And I've had sellers do that where they remodeled the bathrooms and kitchen and they loved it, loved it, mm -hmm. loved it, loved it. And the softer offer who didn't want to change anything. And I just, we didn't do the love letter cause that's illegal, but commun I communicated to the agent, like they don't want to touch anything. They want to move in. They love it. It's a verbal it love letter. We love what you did. Yeah. They love it. And, and, and that, even having the lower price still got them yeah, I've done that the too. conversation, which, yeah. but to your point, if you're not in the market and you don't know the nuances or you don't know the questions to ask of that agent or even that agent, agents sometimes, some have bigger ego, egos than others and, and approaching them in a certain way is more beneficial for your client than, than not. And so it's, Knowing the nuances of the market is one thing, but it's the nuances across the board of the agents, the conversations, correct? the the right combination of those contingencies, knowing what to look for for your buyer. It's, it all backs into it. And it's so and complex. Live, and I've done the, uh, another example on that same idea is there's a, there's some very specific local things that could come back and bite you. We live in a litigious society and real estate is uh, a litigious area. So um, in a multiple offer situation, I have won by just telling them, telling the listing agent, here's how I explained all these potential lawsuit areas for this beach house to my clients. And I explained it three times to them. Did these other agents that are bringing people from other markets and work in other markets, did they explain that to them? And, they, and the agent goes, I'm going to go with your offer, you know, because they don't want a lot. They don't want to be served in two years. Yeah, it's true. I mean, the, there's people think you just, oh, you just write the offer and you send it in and you wash your hands of it. No, you sell the offer to Absolutely. that agent. You sell yeah. it to them. You sell it that it's going to be an easy experience. It's going to it's going to close on time, and your clients are fully aware of the whole scope of this specific property. Exactly. That's, yeah. That's that's nuance, and I you know to your point earlier about the change with having buyer contracts. This is where it's going to be a little bit harder for newer agents to cut their teeth, and they're really going to have to attach to those people like you who are just highly seasoned, highly specialized, so they can understand these conversations before yeah. they're thrown into the fire. Yeah, I think a new, a new agent going in now probably has to hook up with a team or even if it, or with just one mentor or whatever. Agreed. Because I don't see how they can just, they used to be able to be door openers and luck into a, a commission here and there and then just learn over time, but not anymore. Not By the way, I'm doing a, I have in my, on the buyer agency agreement situation, because I speak to people all over the country on this, yeah. um, in the groups I'm in, and it's, everybody's dealing with it differently. And uh, um, I have some clients who just take their whole day or even fly in from another state to look at one property. <laughs> and so I'm writing them on the one property. I say, you know, let's just do this one property. We'll work together. We like each other, whatever. But I'm not going to tell you you got to work with me for three months. You, you can just we'll write it for this property. Everything's cool. And um, and then we'll just look and we can decide whether you want to offer on it. And then they'll look at it and they'll say, thanks a lot. And it'll go away. And it, so I don't get a lot of buyers who uh, some people, if there's somebody's buying in their own neighborhood, they might 
I've had agents tell me their buyers might just call them all the time and just say, show me this house today, show me this house today. I don't get that at all. I get a buyer that shows up to look at one house or a buyer that shows up to look at six houses and they're here for one or two days and then they go away. So it's not a time. The old veteran agents used to say buyers is such a waste of time and everything, not a waste of time, but a time suck. And I, not with me, not when they're not from here, they're not. Yeah. And I agree. I mean, especially when you're working with that specific client base, I've had numerous people who they don't want to sign a six month, a year, anything long. They want a contract for that one property. And most of the time they'll, they won't even look at it themselves. They'll be like, oh, I'll send it to my attorney or I'll send it to my advisor and then they'll get back to you. And so it's a different, it's a different beast. It's not, it's not the same everywhere. That's yeah, sure. they present this change to us as brokers. They present this change and, oh, it's just, you know, here's how you explain your value. I know how to explain my value, but yeah. they present it like, like everybody that is a buyer is buying their own primary home that they're going to live in for 20 years. That's not what's happening in my market, okay, in my clients. And, and they tend to be financially sophisticated. And just like you mentioned, they often have advisors. So uh, that's a different kettle of fish. When you send them a contract that's two or three pages just to show them a house, it's a different ball game. (laughs) Hey friends, are you feeling super frustrated with your content engagement? Let's say you post something on Instagram and it gets two likes and you just don't know how to crack that nut. If so, you are not alone. Many agents that I've talked to through this podcast have experienced the same thing. A very few, some small subset of that have actually figured out how to crack the nut. What I have done to figure out this strategy is I've worked very closely with Steve Blank Jr. And what he did was reverse engineer the whole process is first identifying what's the brand? What communication are we actually going after? What's the content that's going to work for that? and who specifically are we talking to? So if you want more information on this, I highly recommend going and grabbing the free resources at steveblankjr.com slash Realtor180. It is, and it's even the nuance of those conversations, it's a, it takes a different I want I don't want to say it's I don't want to say different caliber agent, but it's a different caliber agent. It's it is, you yeah. just you need to have a there's a level of confidence in how you're conveying it. You have to be able to articulate everything very clear for them to understand, especially the CEOs. They just want bullet points. They don't want the whole song yeah. and dance. Like, give me three bullet points as to why this is important and I'll make a decision. Exactly. And, and, and got to morph. Yeah, you know, the, the luxury, the people that uh, talk about the luxury market, um, the luxury, 21st century luxury is number one is time. If you give any indication to these buyers that you are just wasting their time, flapping your jaws, rather than saying, bang, 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 this is what we're going to do a very efficient way. And I'm really good at it. So let's go to work. And that's, uh, that is really, really valued by those types of buyers. Yeah. And the other thing is there's, you have to convey as you do, no pressure. There's no pressure. If you decide to buy it today, great. Well, I'll get you in position. If not, no problem. And there's no pressure. The moment they, they're different. They feel a little bit of pressure. They're like, they're squirrely. They're like, nope, we're done. Correct. They'll just leave something they might want. And, uh, like that, they did yeah. not, they do not want a salesperson, um, at all. It's true. They want an advisor. They, it, and it's a different, I worked with a client recently who was the CEO and we were going back and forth negotiating and within his role, he, they do a lot of contract negotiations and he just wanted advisement as to how to proceed. He didn't want me to like, it was a, it was a dance. And it was very hard, um, but you know it's a great learning experience as always. Well, that's another reason that see, I have this. Cor- I have a corporate background prior to real estate, and mm. that corporate background was at a multinational in a head office capacity. And so, as did mergers and acquisitions, contracts were, you know, 
contract negotiations were very complex and normal, and I also lived and worked around the world. That's why serving the luxury clientele, especially the the CEO types or, or uh, uh, accomplished types, financially sophisticated types, that's why uh, I fit with that. So um, that helps a lot. But it's funny when you first meet somebody uh, like that, you meet them in a small town on an island, you can see that they think um, you're, you're the local guy from down the street, you know, and so you have to drop a couple hints, you know, you, you know, about the stock market or living in Australia or whatever that yeah. they might relate to. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, this guy might know what he's talking about. Speaking of your West Coast now, but you spent time on the East Coast, didn't you? Yeah, I lived in New York for a couple of years. I lived in South Africa, lived in Australia and basically traveled the world. I was an international business guy and actually went to work in what I studied, which was nice. So Incredible. did that for a long time. And then I, the I, reason the, the reason I asked is you use the word finance and being in San Francisco, I always pick it up from the people who worked on the East Coast. Everybody out here says finance. Oh, that's and true. So yeah, <laughs> I, I picked it up early in this conversation. <laughs> yeah, I, actually, I think I picked that up from being in ex-British colonies because it's definitely there finance go. there. If you're in Sydney, it's finance. So. And, and it's it's those little things when you're talking to a client and you pick that up. Yep. It, it's I, I always call it. It's the um, it's like a crystal ball statement. And they're like, how did you know that? <laughs> and then it, it it immediately greases the slide for the conversation. Yes. Yeah. It gets you to get you some mutual respect. I'm a basketball fan and the, my favorite basketball uh phrase or cliche is game recognizes game and uh and that's kind of what that touches on and also among agents i was telling my wife the other day that you know i can talk to a, an agent for five or ten minutes and then i got it you know I, yeah. game recognizes game and you know you don't do what i do what you do is fine but you don't do what i do so let's talk more creatively with the people who do I feel like you're more savvy than five or 10 minutes. I feel like in the 30 seconds, you'd figure it out really quick. Yeah, it can be, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think you, you uh, especially if you're with working with people at the volume that you are and the caliber you are, I'm, I'm sure you can, you can tell right away. Yeah, you, you, know, can, you know it right away. That's, that's one of the great things about just networking a little bit in once you've understood what you really do, uh, yeah. what you want to do, and then you got to hit that network. The referrals come from it, which are just great, but that's not the reason. The, the, the knowledge that comes from it is exceptional. Um, I'm, in, I'm in a second home and vacation market and vacation rental, and I belong to a group called Compass Retreat. Used, we used to be called the Vacation Collective. It's just fantastic. You get, you know, uh, people in Aspen, people in the Hamptons, people. I just saw my buddy in Scottsdale a couple of days ago and, and in these vacation markets. And it's a different ball game. Selling family homes in a neighborhood is way different than selling second homes in a resort area. And it's a very different type of real estate and a very different type of way to deal with the clients. So uh, and sharing that information um, in just regular, like monthly calls or whatever is really helpful. Remind me after this, I'll text it to you. There's, um, I have a link that it shows migrations. So you can type in the zip code you're in, and then yeah. you can literally in real time, see where people are migrating from. And it changes as they move around. There's seasonally. a couple of people. That's funny. That was mentioned on our last call. There's a couple of people that are using that in my, in that compass resort group. It's great. And then you and then you can uh, the the micro targeting that's available if you're trying to do lead generation is mm -hmm. exceptional. Um, I'm sure you're very aware of it, uh, but a lot of people aren't. A lot of people just kind of splash their marketing budget around, and you can micro target down to just a razor thin uh, niche, and and all of a sudden these buyers come out for you. 
It's pretty incredible. The amount of data that both Google and Facebook mm -hmm. have is incredible and you can refine it. So you can look at it, hey, I can get a bunch of leads or you can look at it and go, my God, that's frightening. <laughs> you know, they know, they know everything about you. Everything. They just do. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and, you know, and when you start really slicing it down, you tend to find these groups of people also do these other things that you can find backdoor ways in to have these same conversations. There's um, my two good friends, the Knox brothers out of Naples. They are basically part of a golf community, but the properties they sell are the ones that butt up against the golf course. Mm -hmm. And so they spend all the time on a course and all their marketing is heavy geared towards golf and golfers and so mm -hmm. and then you know to your point the layer in with with facebook and google you can really niche it down to these absolutely tiny tiny little details so you're hitting that that perfect person instead of getting you know 100 garbage leads you're getting three that are just like golden you know this uh um i was just at a compass event in tahoe and the uh Mark McLaughlin, who does a strategy out of New York, and he gives a speech. I'd seen him give it once before, but he's like, if you send me Mark, he says, I'm a luxury buyer. And if you send me marketing that says, ooh, high end tequila and fat and cigars, I'm going to throw it in the trash. But if you send me marketing that says scotch, and sports cars, I'm going to read it. Or it might have been the other way around. I don't know. Whatever. But he says you have to know you can't just send out marketing. You have the in the 21st century. If and really with the luxury buyers, some people are really doing this at the very high end. Is they're saying, I want that person. What does that person like? And are actually doing individually tailored ads to the, like the billionaire class. I'm not doing that, but I know it's out there and people are doing it. Yeah. I mean, you know, for the most part, I, I don't think people even have an avatar of who their ideal client is. Yeah. I think and, that's true. You know, and, and even, you know, to back into that, they, unfortunately a lot of, and it's not, it's not wrong because it's different, but they generalize and don't specialize. And when you, generalize it's hard to create a very hyper specific target because it's you're kind of all over the map yeah yeah but well yeah. if you want to i mean if, if you look at consumer marketing so do you have the budget to be bud light or do you have the budget to be uh so-and-so microbrewery india pale ale if you're a if you're a real estate broker, you're on that you're on that microbrewery niche. You got to find who drinks that. You got to find specifically uh, who's going to buy this, uh, who's going to be interested in this, and you can't just pretend you're Coca Cola or Bud Budweiser because you're not. So it's it lends itself to mic to niche marketing. You know, and the other thing that I've learned from my experience is. If you, for me, for example, if I try to just run ads to San Francisco, I'm now competing with Redfin, Compass, Vanguard. Yep. But if I niche down to a very hyper specific neighborhood or even street, the likelihood of them doing that is less and I'll have a higher opportunity to optimize that, that one thing that people are searching for. And it'd so, be easier to write, it'll be easier to write something that w will resonate with the target um, rather than something broad for the whole city. So, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because you tend to know, to your point, it's you, when you really start to drill down, you tend to know things about that specific area that the people in that area do more of. Mm -hmm. And it's easier to enter that conversation. I think the other thing that totally drives me absolute bonkers is agents who don't segment their lists and they try to send the same communication to buyers as they do sellers, as they do to agents. And then yeah. they hit, they just tick everybody off and they get all these unsubscribes. Yeah. <laughs> and it exactly. just, ah, oh, it's terrible. Yeah, it's terrible. So somebody, I learned this just like, within a year or two of starting in real estate. But if somebody had sent me, say my budget is $800,000 for, 
for this house, for a house, and I want it on an acre. And then I send them a tiny lot for a million. They're like, I just told you this three days ago, and you didn't listen exactly. to a word I said. And you can't just say, oh, but I sent that to everybody. You can't really explain yourself. You just have to say, um, you know, sorry. So I, I did that because there are some services that automatically, you know, send, send out listings to people. You got to be very careful of that. People hate being sent something that they just told you they didn't want to look at. Um, so you got to be very careful. You know, it's similar with, with my market is a lot of my clients work for Google Meta and they have shuttles. And so part of my expertise is when a client says, hey, I want to look in Noe. And then I can say, well, there's actually a pickup shuttle here. The train connects to it. So if you want to look in Coal Valley, that might be an option too. And so you, you just got to know these, you have to, it's like, you have to know the details and how to enter these conversations in a very more nuanced way. Person, it's personal and it is really yeah. all it comes down to is humanizing yeah. the, their experience. Are you seeing much in your market since it's tech, Seattle is tech also, but it, since it's tech, are you seeing a push maybe at the entry level or lower end with do it yourself, unrepresented buyers in so in san francisco which is only seven by seven miles which is pretty small it's smaller than disney's parking lot which is crazy <laughs> <laughs> but we have over a hundred neighborhoods and there are pockets of the city where they're unrepresented and they go more to the listing agent and they try to get them to write it and then there's other areas of the city where we tend to have a higher price point and those people tend to have representation. So it's, it's kind of, it depends. It depends on the, the location, the property and who's looking at it. Yeah, I think so. I think the higher price points are still going to get buyers who realize the value of representation, but I think yeah, it'll be a mess the, for at the lower the, price the, points. The massive bulk of my business is it's past client referral or clients who've already worked with me. That's, that is the bulk of my business. And those conversations are a little bit easier to enter because yeah. if they're being referred, there's, they've either been told about the experience or there's an implied knowledge that there's going to be some sort of contract or something that that's going to happen. And if the clients already worked with me, it's, I already know them, so it's very easy to enter that conversation. Yeah, that's nice. That's a good um, business to build. But I haven't, surprisingly, now that I think about it in this short period, I haven't had somebody reach out to me totally cold where that I've had zero established relationship and I've gotten them to, to look at properties or assign. I haven't actually had that experience yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I get sure people, I well, I, I just spend a lot of on lead gen because it's kind of one-offs for me. Yeah. Um, but they're still warm because they're qualified and they've seen my stuff and all that. So yeah. it's not just somebody walking in the door. Um, but it's But again, for the new broker, the newly licensed broker, that's a tough nut to crack there because they're going to be... Uh, it's going to be hard for them to get clients. They're going to have to work with somebody to give them clients. I think the benefit though is, you know, in time it's, it's going to elevate the entire industry. No doubt. I can't not because those, the, the people who do it part time, they're just not going to be able to carry those conversations to, they're either going to get themselves into legal trouble because they're not doing it, or they're just yeah. not going to get the buyer to understand the need to sign this thing and they're not going to do it. And they'll, they'll well, if you, if you want to see the part timers, you should look in the, I just had this conversation a couple of days ago with my buddy in Scottsdale that go to the second home markets. If you want to see part timers, there's hundreds and hundreds of people that just keep their real estate license, sell one property a year, which means they're not keeping up with industry trends or regulations. And, the, and it's just, and they're not really, they're not on their game. And so if you want that person to represent you, um, just because they, 
you happen to, they seem likable. That's just not a good idea. Yeah. It's funny. I just talked to a new agent. I had lunch with a, a brand new licensed agent the other day. And I said, if you work full time, you're going to get part time results. If you work part time, you're going to get no results. So yeah, prepare yeah. your finances in advance so you can do this a hundred percent of the time and learn this stuff. Yeah. And you better hope you've got a couple years of survival finance because you're not going to make any money for a couple of years. I mean, it's rough. It. It's, it's a, rough. it's a kill what you eat business. And I don't <laughs> think exactly. people get that at, in the beginning. Like it's, I, my savings grace was I came from, I, I was a membership director at a club that their base was the affluent clientele. So I had a lot of interactions with the CEOs and the execs, and I learned how to speak that language. Yeah. And then I, I good. brought some of those clients over. So I was able to do a lot of nurture campaigns, but well, that's a good having, segue right there. That's a, a good place. It to was be. incredible. Um, you know, because you meet somebody, you have 15, maybe 20 minutes to get them to like you, to trust you move them through this whole experience, get them to spend a couple thousand dollars on an initiation and then get started. And that's, wow. It's a, it's a magic trick. It's not, it's, it's tough, but it's that base. That's what helped me get into this, this space. And so it's great. Yeah. I think people really, yeah. I mean, I think if people have something that they can refer to, like with you, you had, the finance strength and the marketing strength. And, and that was kind of your, your secret sauce going into this and the confidence, which is, that's huge. Yeah. It's very helpful. It, it, it's uh, yeah. For the new, new agent, it's going to be, it's just going to be tough. It's always been, it's always been a real mistake when uh, overall as a society, when you have people spending 90% of people, there are, primary residence is by far their largest asset in their life. And so you're going to let people be professionals. The real estate license is probably easier to get than a barber's license. So, I mean, it's just, uh, I mean, it's, and they're dealing with the largest people's largest assets. And they, I don't, I assume the exams are similar, but as a person with a financial background taking that exam, you're going, you're really not going to ask any, but like any math questions here. <laughs> I was just, I mean, they hardly did ask any math questions. So, um, so there's a lot of people who just have the license that are out there and that, that's, they're just not going to find clients anymore. I don't think. That's what I think is going to happen is, yeah, they're just not going to have their, their book of business is just going to dwindle because it's, it's, it's just not going to be as easy as it once was, which I think is, I think change is always hard, but I think there's a strength and a benefit to it. And so, yeah, it'll, it'll, me. it'll elevate the professionalism overall. You're seeing it now, um, in, in metro areas, I'm in a rural area, but you're seeing it, you know, where at the starter home level, people are saying, Oh, I'll be your buyer agent for a 1%. Or whatever, and it's just that's it's not a good trend. And then people will do it themselves, et cetera, et cetera. And then a year or two later, people will sue and et cetera. So at the luxury end, though, it's people tend to. I've had people, you know, it's their twelfth house they're buying, and as clients, and they go, "Yeah, I know you guys earn your money." You know, they don't. They don't. Uh, sing your praises too high, but they're like, I'm, I'm good with it. You guys make your money. You're, I, I look at it back from my uh, corporate head office days I, in mergers and acquisitions and stuff. You would work with the largest corporate law firms at the senior partner level because there are many millions involved. And so I always try to refer back to the, to the level of professionalism that I've seen in senior partners of large law firms. And it was different and it was different from the new associates, like really different. And so that level, if you just provide that level of professionalism, some people aren't going to notice it, but others will. And, yeah. and the people that do notice it are the people that really value it. 
um, and understand that that, whether you're a wealth advisor or a, a high-end attorney or whatever, you should think of yourself as a real estate broker in those terms, um, yeah. not as not as an insurance salesman. Yeah, I agree. And, and, you know, it's when you meet that client, it's those who know will know. And yeah. that's, that's who it matters to, because they will, they pick up those nuances, even, even if they don't acknowledge it, there's, yeah, they won't acknowledge level, it, but they'll notice, yeah. but they'll notice they, yeah. they absolutely notice and they'll notice if you don't have it and mm -hmm. they'll be gone. They'll be, they just, they vanish. Yeah. Next. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. It's such a, it's such an interesting, all of this is, it's a, it's an interesting transition that we're going to. And, and, uh, the one cool thing in having sitting down, having the ability to sit down with all these amazing, amazing agents, it's the ones who are like, okay, this is happening. Let's, let's pivot. They're mm -hmm. the ones who are already ahead of the pack. It's the old guard who are digging in their heels and they're like, we always did it this way. And there oh, has yeah. to be a workaround. They're stuck. What they're a just dumb idea pivot. in human history. It's like the person that event like the guy in the cave who didn't like the fire, you know, the guy invented fire. And then the other guy in the corner of the cave said, Oh no, that's terrible. Go away that's with funny. it. <laughs> when uh, when uh, Henry Ford asked farmers what they wanted, they all said a faster horse. Exactly. Yeah. That's one of my favorites, <laughs> um, which I love that. Cause that's, that's what it feels like. It's like, this is a car. Like, and we have an amazing opportunity. And I agree. Pushing and, back and against change is just the dumbest thing, you know, it is. being proactive in front of it will just lead to lead to success and, and lead to success for you and your clients, actually. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, it's the mindset of if you just have that mindset of I'm going to adopt this, I'm going to figure it out, I'm going to excel in this thing. You're already halfway there. It's just execution exactly. after that point. Exactly. Mike, as promised, the, uh, the time flew by. Yes, uh, absolutely. Thank you. I, I, this is such a great conversation. I really thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and again, I will, I'm going to text you that link and then I'm going to send you the invite to the, to the inner circle. I, I am absolutely okay. looking forward to having you join that. Good. Me too. I look forward to it. I appreciate it, Sean.